you have your Bibles with you, we are in the book of James again today. We're in James chapter 4, verse 13 is where we'll start. We'll work our way partly through chapter 5 as well. And so uh, if you need a Bible, there's one on the back shelf there. And like I say, whenever I point them out, they are a gift. You're welcome to take one home if you don't have one. Um, but do feel free to, to make yourself available to that. And we want to read God's word together. So there's two sections that we're kind of melding together here, and in some ways it might seem like they don't get, like they don't go together, but I appreciate the one person, the one other person, I guess, than me that put these two together is a man by the name of Douglas Moo, and what he described this as, yeah, you can make fun of his name later, uh, Douglas Moo says that what these two passages have in problem in, in common is that they display the implications of a Christian worldview. And so we would acknowledge that as we've worked our way through James, it started by talking about our own hearts, where we were at with God, what we were doing with our tongues, what we were speaking and saying, how we were thinking and feeling, it began by addressing that, and then it moved on to say, and now you're gathering in community with your church family, and there's ways in which these things I've said have implications on that. It feels like now it's taking the next step and saying, and then once you're done in this place, you are going to go out into the world and make decisions about what your life is to look like. And in those places too, God has a lot to say about what you say and what you do, about your tongue and your actions. And so, I think Douglas Moo is right. These are the implications of a Christian worldview. This is how these ideas are meant to play out in how we do life out in the real world. And so we're in chapter 4, verse 13. The first section we're going to look at is, is the end of chapter 4, and then we'll look at the beginning of chapter 5 together. Now listen, you who say... Today or tomorrow, we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. I think we got to start by, by acknowledging that the purpose of the text is to display to us that in our work in the world, in the ways in which we engage and plan our lives in the world, we ought to be reliant on God. That we're not meant to just make our own plans and have it be about ourselves, but that we are to live out our lives in daily reliance on, jo on God. And especially in making those big picture plans and deciding where to go and where to set up shop and where to, to do life, we're to rely on God. And one of the reasons that, that the, the writer of James reminds us of this is because this, the, the nature of this life is transitory, that we are preparing for the next that we will be in a spot in our future, if you're a believer in Christ, where we will be completely reliant on God, where we'll be in his presence, where he will speak directly to us, and we're to practice or prepare for that here. And so we acknowledge that our lives here are not our own any more than they are in the next life. And so in all that we do, we're to say, if the Lord wills it. Now, when I first was interviewing for the job at this church, one of the things they asked me was how long I intended to stay. And I get why they asked the question. It's a great question. You should ask that in a job interview. Um, you should expect people to lie after that if you're interviewing for a secular job because they'll always tell you they plan to stay forever. That's been my experience anyway. Um, but when I was asked at the church, my answer was, I plan on staying three months to the rest of my life. And the reason for that was, if I started on day one and I heard from the Lord on day one, you've made a mistake, this was not where you're supposed to be, I'll probably spend three months praying about it, and then I'll resign. Because that's how I want to live my life, is in response to where God has me. Because I know that living in the center of his will is far better than living outside of it. And so whether it involved uprooting my family or, or, or upsetting people, it would just be better to be in the center of God's will than to do the things that please people. Now the trick of it is that sometimes we talk about these things as if this is just how pastors should think. But to be clear, this text is not talking about those who have a call. It's talking about those who are doing life and doing business as if they have a call. And that's what we're called to do. When you are in business, when you are doing work outside of the church, you are still to act as if God has a plan, because he does, 
and to go where he leads because he leads. And if you do, life will go better for you. Now, we shouldn't use this as an excuse to be flaky or to avoid commitments altogether or to call, or to call into question God's planning. We're to do this as an act of our dependence on God, to display that we trust him to show that he has a plan and that we are just seeking to follow that over and above all else, over and above any of the other attractions this world holds. You may notice in the midst of this conversation, he's still talking about language though. We've talked about how much of James is about how we, how we speak, what we say. And so he says, do not say, but even in your language, acknowledge God's presence and his leading. It's really easy, kind of when you live life out there, to forget that we're called to speak about God in the world. Not just in church on Sunday, not just in other places, but in our workplace. You know, how many of you have ever quit a job in your workplace by saying, I think God's leading me to somewhere else? That's what James is calling us to do. To acknowledge to those that we work with that God is of utmost importance in our life and that our desire is to seek and to follow him. That that's what we're aiming at. And as much as it is about language, it is of course, as James repeats time and time again, still about our heart. Because it's not just about expressing that it's about God and then doing whatever we want. It's about actually figuring out what God wants for us in the next season of life. And then removing any obstacles to follow through on that. Verse 17 is a bit of an odd one. It stands out a little bit in this, in, this, uh, in this text. Most theologians think it's probably a traditional saying that's been included, uh, but let's take a quick look at it. It says, if any, anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. On the surface, this seems like a verse that is perhaps about sins of, of, of omission, that there are times where God is calling us to do something and we don't do it, and in that we sin. And I think there is precedence for that. There is scriptural support for that idea that there can be times where we sin in our lack of obedience, in our lack of submission, in something that we don't do when we're called to do it. And yet in this, it seems to be connected to the idea of moving to set up a business. That's what James is saying. And it's almost as if he's saying, you've heard my words, now heed them. I've told you the truth, now do it. It's not enough just to hear this, but to act on it, which again is such a repetitive idea for James because we need to hear it so often. We need to be cautious perhaps around what we put in the pile of sin, but there are certainly times where God is leading and we're not responding. And that lack of submission to him is sin. Let's take a look at the next section, chapter five, verse one through six. Now listen, you rich people, Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you have failed to pay the workers who who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You've condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. It's a section that doesn't sound like it fits in the New Testament, right? Like, that's the things those Old Testament prophets talked about. That's not for us today, for sure. Some commentators, when they talk about this passage, feel that the rich people in this section, that it's addressing people outside of the church. And there's reasons for that. It's got such a strong language of condemnation. And though that condemnation isn't eternal, it still sounds really condemning to say that to a son of God or someone who's following Christ. And their actions equally seem far outside the behavior of one who has submitted to Christ or made him Lord. That you would even murder for the sake of advancing your own financial gain. John Calvin tries to answer this question of of how this could be addressing those within the church while talking about those outside. And he says, James has a regard to the faithful. He's talking to those in the church. But his purpose is that they hearing of the miserable end of the rich might not envy their fortune, their fortune, 
and also that knowing that God would be the avenger of the wrongs they suffered, they might with a calm and resigned mind bear them. So Calvin says that this is spoken to people within a church and describes what's happening out in the world in order that we might both have the resiliency we need to see ourselves through times where we're oppressed and also that we might not envy the fortune of those that are outside the church collecting it inappropriately. It seems to heavily address this idea of accumulating wealth as being part of the problem that we see in the world. And it was spoken at a time where, uh, where, J- where in the country of Israel there was a form of feudalism, or at least some type of feudalism, where there were a few wealthy land lo- landowners, many of the others had lost their land, and then there was the masses. And landowners could demand what they wanted from tenants who could be easily ejected or replaced if they didn't comply and provide what was asked of them. And so we had this system that was ripe for abuse that allowed for a few to take advantage of the many. And while wealth distribution in Canada certainly has ebbed and flowed through history, it seems like in some ways we are in a season once again where vast wealth is being held by a relative few. In our own country, according to Stats Canada, 1% of the population holds 25% of the wealth, while the bottom 40% of our population holds 2.8% of the wealth. Now, without speaking to our own situation, the response that we often get is that some in society work hard and others are lazy. And while there may be some acknowledgement that that happens in today's world, at James' times, that wasn't really a problem. They had a deep work ethic. There was an understanding that you would work hard to support your nation, your country, and, and the work of the Lord. And so it wasn't a problem. There was just this group of people that were being taken horrific advantage of by those that had the wealth and maintained it. And again, we might certainly say, well, this is written to those outside the church, not to us. I suspect if you've spent time in the church, you know that these types of things happen within the church as well and is meant as a cautionary tale for us. The text does not deliberately, does not directly condemn the idea of having wealth but it condemns the idea of hoarding it and of unjust practices in acquiring it. And this is the consistent teaching of scripture around wealth. That it's not ungodly to have much, but when you hoard it or have a heart that's ungenerous in sharing it, and when you've acquired it by unjust practices, whether it's in the Old Testament in the time of the prophets or today, God has a lot to say about that attitude. And finally, he gives a reason for why we should be cautious of this, and that is the folly of putting our trust in the things of this world. They will rot and they will disappear. And so not only is it unrighteous and ungodly, it's also just unwise to spend all your time investing in advancing your personal wealth. So we see in this that there are implications to the idea that Christ has a call on our hearts and that it's to change how we present ourselves in the world. That in where we move and what we go, it is to be again submitted to Christ. It's to be examined through the lens of what he wants for us and that is the utmost and paramount answer. All the rest of the arguments become irrelevant once God has spoken. Secondly, it gives this caution about how much of our time we spend acquiring or seeking out wealth and what we do in order to attain it. That we are to be just and righteous in our dealings with those that have less. And that we're to retreat with respect those that are in our service. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, I am thankful for this text that you share with us through your servant, James. Lord, may we once again examine our hearts in these matters. Explore whether we're setting our path based on our own desires and wants. Whether we're moving to this place or that or taking this job or that job because it advances our career or or gives us what we desire to ascertain. Or whether we're doing so in response to you and your word, to what you're calling of us in this moment, to who you're calling us to be. Lord, our desire is that our lives would become more and more like that of your sons who submitted all things to his father and responded in obedience to his voice. 
Lord, may we similarly submit ourselves to you afresh and anew today. And may we hear your voice and be quick to reply with a yes. In your name we pray, amen. Call on our worship team to come lead us once again. You may feel free to sit, stand, or whatever you would like. We're going to sing God, I Look to You again. the benediction now may God himself the God of peace sanctify you through and through may your whole spirit soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ the one who calls you is faithful and he will accomplish it amen go in peace